this is not part of the Keller Williams curriculum. This course doesn't come from Keller Williams University. There's no place that you're going to go and find it on KWU. But this is kind of one of my originals, probably uh, some of the classes, maybe a third of what I teach. I kind of write. I have a coaching and consulting business outside of here. And uh, some of these are classes that I teach there that I've just put onto our KW PowerPoints. But I want to talk a little bit about the imposter syndrome. Good morning. Because I think the imposter syndrome is a real thing. And guys, if you can, if you can open up your cameras and mics for a, a, a lunch and learn, that's always ideal for me. And if you're not in a position to do that, no worries. There's no pressure. But it always is, is easier for me to um, have you know a conversation where we can kind of see each other. If you're driving, if you're uh, having a bad hair day, if you've got kids at home that you're trying to educate and, uh, and, you, and you don't want us to kind of get too caught up in all that, I get it. No worries. But um, I'm going to tell you that for a lot of us, the imposter syndrome is, is a real challenge. And um, as I continue to let folks in the room, uh, you know, what are we talking about? What, do you, what is this? Well, and here's the definition. If you just go and type imposter syndrome into Google, this is what will come up. It says uh, the imposter syndrome, sometimes known as the imposter phenomenon, is, is, or sometimes even a fraud syndrome, it, it's a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, their talents and accomplishments, and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. And uh, it can become crippling for folks. And, and sometimes what you find is the imposter syndrome shows up in people that you would be hard pressed to believe would struggle with this. People who are achieving the most unbelievably measurable measures of success that our society can bestow on people. People who are performers and athletes and lots and lots of folks can be subject to kind of fall and pray to this notion of doubting their own self. And, you know, here it's common. Here's, here's just a little gra a graphic. Here's a breakdown, a distribution chart that shows how many people experience the imposter syndrome in their lifetime. And the yellow bar here, this sort of green color, is people who get the imposter syndrome. And this orange one here is- I don't see that. Other people who get the imposter syndrome. Are we not seeing my screen share? No. Okay. There you go. All right. Let's go back to the screen. This green is people who get the imposter syndrome. This orange people is other people who get the imposter syndrome. And the blue over here is literally everyone else who also gets the imposter syndrome. It happens for a lot of us frequently when we're asked to kind of step into something that we've never done before. When we're asked to perform before we feel prepared. That's where this comes into play. And it happens to a lot of us. Now, why is it so common in real estate? And I do think it's, it, it happens a lot more in real estate than it does in other, in other entrepreneurial ventures. Anybody have some thoughts or some feelings? Or maybe why, if you're kind of had thoughts like this before of saying, gee, I'm really not sure that I want to do this, this listing presentation. I don't want to be exposed when they realize that I don't really know all that I am talking about. Why do you think our profession lends itself to more of this than others? Anybody have a thought on that? So much rides on it. Say that again, Fatima. So much rides on there. Just, uh, you know, you're selling someone's home. You're, it's a lot of money. It's their equity. Cheryl, it's a lot of pressure there, right? That drives some of that is to say, look, you know, because it's so important, you, a lot of us want to make sure that we do it right, right? And, and that's what a licensed person should want. But why else do you think our profession is in many ways more prone to this notion of this imposter syndrome? Go um, ahead, Stella, go ahead. Hi, good, good afternoon. Um, I feel it being a new agent, um, I feel the imposter syndrome, mainly because there's so many different agents out there that know so much more than me that at times I feel insecure speaking to someone and feel like I'm being an imposter when I tell them you know, market analysis or information that maybe somebody else does better. But in reality, I know my stuff and yeah. I have to shake that feeling off. But deep down inside, I feel like, well, who are you, Stella? You don't know the market as well as Joe Smith that's been doing it for 30 years. You know, that's really what, to me, what it means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, one of the biggest places for me 
that I wrestled with this notion of, of, of being an imposter was the day I took my daughter home from the hospital. Now, now picture this for a second. She's successfully made it now, past her 26th birthday. She's, she's a good kid and she's doing some good things in the world. But I remember feeling the moment that the nurse put her in my hands and I was to put her now in the car seat and take her home, that I had more instructions when I bought a microwave oven than I had to be prepared <laughs> to be a dad. And I'm like, oh my God, am I really up for this? And then here's what happens. You have to put the kid in the car seat and the car seat has to be facing backwards now. And the nurse is kind of looking and she's not allowed to touch the car seat. She's not allowed to tighten it up or put it in. They, they would have security come and put the car seat in for you if you didn't know how to do it. But I always had the sense now she's watching, right? She's watching. Am I doing it well, right? I'm going to get exposed. And one of the things that you learn as a parent, hopefully, is that you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be good enough, right? You don't have, there is no such thing, I don't think, as being a perfect parent. Every parent has had those days that you wish you could take back again. My father used to say that he felt that he was always a heartbeat away from a diaphragm referral with the three of us. Okay. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be good enough. And what you find is that we're good enough. The question of why our industry, I think, yeah. is so challenged with this, some of it comes with our independent contractor model. You know, one of the challenges that we have as independent contractors is you're not an employee. And as an employee, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you how to do it. Here's what I know. Everybody who's on the Zoom call right now, all of us, all 21 of us have a license. And here's what else I know, because I'm a licensed real estate instructor. I know what's in that course content. There ain't enough in that course content for you to really feel like you know what you're doing. The truth of the matter is, at the end of 75 hours and passing an exam, you don't really know what you're doing yet. And that's a challenge for us because the way that our compensation structure works is that you don't get paid until you deliver an outcome. Mm -hmm. And in order to deliver an outcome means you got to go find an opportunity. And as a result, you're being asked to go make opportunities happen when you don't really know what you're doing yet. How many people have felt that feeling? Like, oh my God, is this the craziest as business model of all time? You know, here's how it works in another industry. In other industries, um, I'll come back to the learning cycle in a second. In other industries, here's what happens. You develop skills first. And then when you've developed skills, you decide I'm really good at doing what I'm doing. Why don't I start my own company? And you go to the market as an independent, Absolutely. but you do it on the back of proficiency. We put the cart before the horse in real estate. We say, we're going to go ask you to go out and market yourself before you've developed the skills that you need in order to feel confident in what you do. It is totally backwards from what every other industry does. And as a result, there's a lot of second guessing, right? There's a lot of second guessing. And the reality is that that's just the way that our, our model, I think it's crazy, personally. I would love, honestly, I would love to see an internship program in our industry. I would love to see a model similar to other kinds of sales, like pharmaceutical sales. Anybody come from a different sales environment before real estate? Anand, what did you, you told me, you, I'm trying to remember what it was that you were doing before here. Oh, it was the lovely world of life insurance. Life insurance. Yeah, there's other folks here. Now, life insurance sometimes works a little bit like we do as well. But I can tell you, I come out of healthcare. And here's what happens with pharma sales. You get a base salary. When, and on that base salary, they're teaching you what to do. And they're not just turning you loose on their prime accounts to go out there and market their drugs to their doctors and to their hospital systems. They're teaching you what to do. They're teaching you how to do it. There's a bonusing structure in place, but there's a safety net in place as well. We've got none of that in this business. And so what happens is I'm pushing you out. I'm pushing you out there. I'm saying, go find an opportunity. And as a result, you know, I'm willing to take calls. I took a call last night. I was talking to somebody last night who says, I'm writing an offer here. It's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It's now nine o'clock at night. We're having a conversation on the phone. 
because you got to know that if you've created an opportunity before you're ready, that you've got a wingman. We'll talk about that in a second. But there's just, I think our industry is nuts in that regard. And I don't know exactly how to fix that. I think that there's a big financial investment in not going to the pharmaceutical sales model where everybody gets a salary and a bonus. I don't think brokers could afford many of us. A lot of us that aren't performing wouldn't stick around. And there wouldn't be as many opportunities for realtors. And good, bad, or indifferent, you can argue that to the cows come home. However, I think there's this other thing with the adult learning cycle, which we'll talk about. Here's how adults learn, different than the way kids learn. Here's the pattern. We start out not knowing what we don't know. We call it unconscious incompetence. I'm really incompetent and I don't know it yet. And it's this happy, blissful, blissful place. And then what happens is once you come and you get some basic learning, once you've passed your licensing exam and you come into the real estate environment and you start to get into some classes and you start to look around, anybody who's got a modicum of intelligence has this moment where they're like, oh my God, I don't know nearly what I need to know in order to be successful here. And that's what we call conscious incompetence. And quite honestly, this part sucks. Adults don't like that feeling. You know, kids don't care. Kids do not care at all. If you think about kindergartners and preschoolers, I use this as an example. If I went into a preschool class and I said, how many of you kids can draw? Every single hand would go to the ceiling. The kids would be excited. How many of you guys can draw? Oh, I can draw, I can draw. Let me show you, I'll draw on the wall. No, don't do that, right? They get so excited because, and some of them are squiggling around because they know that they can draw. If I started this Zoom room with 21 of you that said, how many of you guys can draw? Maybe some of you who feel competent in that space would raise their hand. The rest of you would say, mm, not so good. You'd sit on your hand because you would filter it by, I can draw, but I can't draw well. And if I can't do it well, then I don't want to admit that I can do it. And that's part of a cognitive development that happens later on in life. You don't even have that part of your brain that creates that judgment until you're sort of an adolescent. And in God's wisdom and mercy, God prevented children from being so caught up in self-critique until they've had a chance to learn some things, right? But here's what happens with adult learners. You come into an area that you've never learned before. You don't know what you don't know. Now you start to realize you don't know enough. This is the place where we panic. This is the place where a lot of us freeze up. This is where a lot of us say, I can't take another step forward. I can't do this lead generation. I'm not willing to put myself in a position to go on an appointment until I figured out what I need to figure out because I'm not going to put myself in a position to look stupid and make a mistake because it's important. And adult learners, adults don't like to. We like to look good. We like to be right, right? Right? Look, I, I have learned over time that looking stupid is the price you pay for trying new things. And, you know, John Maxwell, who's kind of a mentor of mine, has a book that he wrote called Fail Forward. And the notion is you're going to stink at it the first time and you're going to learn from it. You know, we all like to believe that we learn from our experience and we don't. We learn from our evaluated experience. We have an experience, we fall down, we learn something from it, and then we go again. I was talking to an agent who's not on this Zoom call, I don't believe, and so I'm not going to call out who this agent was, but it was an agent who was really struggling because she was doing some FISBO calls and she really kind of spit the bit. She screwed up. And I said, guess what? That's what happens when you try to do something new. But here's the thing. Just think about the fact that when you first were learning how to walk, you stood up, you fell down, and what did you do? You had this overwhelming desire to learn how to walk. So you stood up again and you fell down again and you stood up again and you fell down again. And at some point you learned how to roll, tuck and roll because you're falling so much. You learn how to fall and not get hurt. But over time you learn how to keep getting up, right? And so this conscious incompetence part, if we allow ourselves to fall victim to saying, I'm not going to, Go forward until I can go forward without falling down. You will never take the step that you need to take. You will not build momentum. 
And because our backwards commission system says you don't get paid until you deliver an outcome, if you're waiting until you can deliver a flawless outcome before you can get paid, you better have some cash reserves because it's going to take too long. You will run out of runway before this plane has got to get airborne. The next step for adult learners is if you can push through this conscious incompetence and learn what you need to learn and surround yourself with the right mentors and the right training, you can become consciously competent, which says, I know what to do, but I haven't internalized it yet. I kind of have to use a cheat sheet. I have to think about it every step of the way. Think about learning how to drive. Right in the very beginning, you didn't know what you didn't know. First time you get behind the wheel of the car, you recognize, oh my God, I could really mess this up. I live right around the corner from the five star, five star driving school here in, in town, in my town in Westfield. And, and periodically these kids are learning how to drive and I see them driving around and they're in the cars with their hands exactly in the 10 to position. They're going precisely 25 miles an hour in the residential neighborhoods. They're looking at their mirrors, they're looking at their instrument cluster because they're now consciously competent. And it doesn't take long after you drive for a while where you don't have to really think about it anymore. Now we get in the car, our head is someplace else, we're driving home, we're not paying attention. There's times that I know that you've pulled into your driveway and parked your car, you don't even remember the trip because your head was somewhere else. And yet I trust you didn't run anybody off the road, you stopped at all the stop signs, right? You, you, you didn't break the speed limit too badly. That's what unconscious competence looks like over time. And this adult learning cycle is fraught with this part right here called conscious incompetence, which is where we can be most afraid of feeling like a fraud, right? When we were kids, we remember that story, the emperor's new clothes, right? He had that magic suit that he wasn't really wearing anything and he, everybody told him he looked great, right? This is what it feels like. I'm not willing to go out there naked and look like a fool, right? The faster we can be willing to kind of take a chance, the better it's going to be. So, so what's more likely true though, and, and here's the truth, what's more likely true is we have this assumption that what I know and what I think others know is so much bigger than what I really know. What's really true out there is it's not as distorted as you like to think it is. Y you know more than you think. They don't know as much as you think they do, right? The thing we've got to think about is this. It's an inconvenient truth. And I stole this from Ray Bradbury. First, you jump off the cliff and then you build your wings on the way down. It is a leap of faith. That is the definition of a leap of faith is you jump off the cliff and you trust that you will build your wings on the way down. Um, I remember watching a mama bird push baby bird out of the nest one time. And baby bird didn't fly right away. Baby bird fell to the ground with a thud, kind of hobbled underneath a, a, a bush and then baby bird kind of stretched the wings out a little bit and started to learn to fly. You gotta be willing to jump. Now, there are some strategies that help, right? If we, if we just start with the premise that I, I get it, I'm gonna be asked to jump and build my wings on the way down. I'm gonna be asked to do things before I know exactly what to do. What are some of the strategies? Well, strategy number one is get really clear. We're gonna unpack each one of these. Get really clear on what do you need to really master to be successful and what don't you? And we'll unpack that. Number two, what do you already know, right? Um, number three, we're going to talk about finding wingman. In the very beginning, it really pays to have a wingman, right? Who can kind of have your back. Number four, set up a realistic growth plan. We'll talk about that. And number five, there are some proven hacks that you can leverage that will help you feel more confident in your skills and in yourself until you've developed the, the confidence that comes through experience. Nothing beats the confidence that comes through experience. But until you've got experience, there are some hacks that I'm gonna teach you. Let's start with number one, be clear on what's really needed. If we study surveys of buyers and sellers in real estate and we ask them, what's the most important thing? What are you looking for in terms of skill? What are you looking for in terms of relationships? Let's be clear, this is what buyers say what they want more than anything else. Help me find the right home. All right, that's the thing that's most important. Not help me find any home. Buyers can find inventory, 
what they want our help with is helping them sort, help them make decisions on what's the right home for them and why, which means one of the things that we're gonna to need to develop as quickly as we can is knowledge of the inventory. That's why those of you that are in Ignite, we're asking you to preview 10 homes a week in person and be looking at inventory online all the time. That's the habit is what's most important. What buyers want is know the inventory well enough that you can help me make decisions. 14% say negotiating the terms of the sale. 11% sell, say helping with price negotiation. So learning some negotiating skills is something that we're gonna focus on earlier on. And here's the good news, guys. If you live to this point in your life, you've made it through by learning how to navigate and negotiate. Now we're gonna to start to figure out is how do I leverage what I already know about how to negotiate, how to build relationship, and how do I take it to another level? That is something that would be on the earlier phase of learning in the real estate space. Learn inventory. Let's learn about some negotiating skills. What do they value? Number one, reputation. Is the agent trustworthy? Are they honest? Right? These are things that they tell us again and again. What's most important to, to me is your character. Are you an upstanding person? What do sellers want? Sellers want help in marketing homes. They want help pricing homes, help you know, getting it sold within a specific time frame. all skills that you did not learn in real estate school. I know because I teach that course and we didn't teach that. These are things that you're going to learn on the job. These are going to be things that you're going to learn as you go. It pays to have a wingman who's already done this before who can, you can shadow. But what do sellers want? They want people who are honest, people who are trustworthy. Again and again, they tell us that's really the most important thing. So number one, what do you already know? Do you know how to be honest? If the answer is no, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll let you keep that to yourself. But that would be something I would ask you to work on, right? Do you know how to be trustworthy? If the answer is no, please don't raise your hand. But guys, I believe that you know this already. The things that are the most important is, and here's what you're going to find. People make their decisions quickly. People make their decisions almost instantaneously. They know, they like you, they trust you based on something about you. And then they use information to justify their decision. So don't get too caught up in, but I haven't done this before. I haven't taken a listing. Don't worry about it. Are you trustworthy? Are you likable? Do you have people who will give you testimony? Do you have people who will stand up for you? I think early on in the game, one of the best ways to overcome the imposter syndrome is to get people who will give testimony to you that speak to your character. And we'll talk about in the affirmational hacks how important that is. But you don't have to have people that can speak to your real estate prowess because you don't have any yet in the beginning. But what you are looking for is people that say, you know what? I know Mike from, I worked with him at another job. I know Hamali from an organization that we both volunteer for. I know Stacy from wherever. And let me tell you a little bit about Stacy. He's a good guy. He's got good character, works really hard. You know, who will speak on your behalf in that way? These are things that I think are really important in the very beginning that you find people that will stand up and give you testimony. A lot of the things that you already know are real estate translatable, meaning skills that you've developed in other parts of your life are the same skills that you will apply in the real estate space. Let me give you a case in point. Anybody a stay-at-home parent right now? Because I can tell you, this is one that comes up a lot as I coach agents through the years, especially people that have stepped out of the workforce for a while and are coming back in. And they say, you know what? I left my seven-figure job, six-figure job, my master's prepared MBA program job because I wanted to stay at home and be there for my kids. And now mm -hmm. I'm coming back into the workforce and I feel like all my skills have atrophied. I hear this a lot. I hear men say that. I hear women say this. And you start to say, okay, let's talk about what skills you are still using. You're trying to stay at home and raise kids for the last 12 years. Um, do you have to have good organizational skills to be a stay-at-home mom or dad? <laughs> say yes. 
I got to manage everybody's calendar. I got to figure out how to get this one to baseball practice and this one to swim practice. And I got to figure out how to get the dog to the vet and the clothes at the dry cleaners. And I got to get shopping in and all these different things that I'm trying to manage. You've got to have impeccable organizational time management skills. Do you think those skills translate well into a real estate space? Say yes. Sure they do, right? Do you have to have good negotiation skills? We said that that's one of the things that people want. If you're a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, have you figured out some things about how to negotiate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of that stuff, right? So the goal right now is what do you already know how to do? And how do you translate that into a real estate specific environment? For most of us, we don't have to learn a lot of new key skills. We've got to finesse some learning that we don't have in terms of how to price a home properly, how to do a CMA, how to market a home. These are skills that you learn, but the things that are the most important, who are you? Do you know how to be honest? Do you know how to be truthful? Do you know how to have good character? Do you know some things about time management? Do you know some things about negotiation? All that stuff, most of us have already figured out. And so trust that the way you learn how to build your wings on the way down is to trust that you've already got what it takes. 90% of what it, you need in this business, you've already got. Robert Fulham, a million years, years ago, wrote a book that I read in, when I was in college, I think, that said everything I needed to learn about life, I learned in kindergarten. I think there's a lot to be said for that, right? It still translates. Now, do you have any skills that work well in the real estate space? We've touched on that, negotiation, communication, organization. It pays to find a wingman because there are certain things that you don't know how to do well yet. Maybe you've never conducted a listing presentation yet. If you're in Ignite, we're practicing that a little bit now because the more we practice it, the more we're gonna feel like we at least have some sense of what to do when I get to that moment. But understand that the first time that you're gonna do it, it's gonna suck. You're not gonna do it well the first time, right? Um, nobody steps out of the womb and is perfect at everything that they do, it pays to have a wingman. And one of the things that I'd encourage you to do is because we do not have an internship program in this industry, because we don't have a paid mentorship program in this company, as some companies do. Some companies, one of the companies that I worked for as an agent and a manager in the very beginning, the very, I think it was the first two to four deals that I did, it was required that they assigned an experienced agent to me and that agent kind of walked me through the paces of what to do, how to fill out the forms. That agent came with me on a listing presentation. That agent kind of shadowed me on my buyer's consultation. And for their knowledge, I paid them 40% of my commission for four deals, right? And so the question becomes, what don't you know that if you did know would make things easier? I know some basic things about how to be a good person and how to be honest and how to be trustworthy. I got that figured out. I know some basic things about negotiating. I'm going to learn how to amp my negotiation skills up. I've learned some basic thing about communication. I'm going to learn how to amp that up. What don't I know? I don't know how to do a listed consultation. I don't know how to do a CMA well. Find a wingman. Find somebody in your office. Who do you admire? Who do you like? Who do you trust? Who do you aspire to be? You know, who already knows the stuff that you need to know that you can lean on? Every single one of us, and I'm going to step out on a little bit of a limb here. Every single one of us was named a sponsor when we came in, in our company. And that sponsor was who is the agent or who is the person that had the most influence on you choosing to be here at Keller Williams? And I say I'm stepping out of limb because it's, we're very clear that sponsorship does not have any responsibilities. If I named you as my sponsor, you don't owe me a thing. I'm gonna do business. And if I create wealth for the company, the profitability of this company is gonna be shared with you because it was your influence that got me here. However, because of the way our profit share model works, your sponsor does have a financial interest in you being successful. And so I, I encourage people to see if your sponsor would be willing to be a wingman for a while, would be willing to say, look, let's do the first one together. And if you succeed, when that deal closes, the company dollar that you generate is going to trigger a profit share distribution to me. I have a financial interest in helping you succeed. And by the way, guys, if you do ever start to build out your profit share tree in this company, and there are people 
who you have influenced who have named you as a sponsor. And there's people that they have influenced and, and been named as a sponsor. One of the things that you will find is that you will start to get a report that shows who are you connected to in your profit share tree? Mine right now, I think goes five different levels. I don't have a ton, a ton of people, but I've got a, a group now of people. And I got to tell you, some of these people are people that I've never met. And yet, if you're four levels or five levels deep in the profit share tree, if you do business and you generate closings every single month, there's going to be a profit share check for me. What I've done is I've chosen to introduce myself to them and say, look, I've been around the block a few times. If you get stuck and you don't know what to do, give me a call because I want you to have that closing work because I want that profit share check at some point. But find a wingman. Who is in your office that you could partner with? Is there an agent who you'd be willing to, to sort of say, look, can we do some of these together? If you're looking for where to go first, the busier the agent is, the less time that they're going to probably have. And so know that you've got to decide what is the value of their knowledge. Most of the time, if you're going to be in a wingman relationship, as I call it, or a mentor relationship as we assigned it in another company, you're going to have to probably be willing to share the commission dollars. Because what you're asking them to do is to share their knowledge so that you can shorten your learning curve. And the price for knowledge is either I figure it out myself over a longer period of time in the school of hard knocks, making mistakes, blowing opportunities, or I get a wingman who's got my back, who, who guides me through securing those opportunities more, more likely. But the trade-off then is I got to probably be willing to cut them in. The busier the agent is, the less time they're likely to have. What I have always found is finding that agent who's kind of been doing this for a while, doesn't have a massive business, but is solid. In our world, that would probably be what we would call maybe a half capper. What is a half capper? A half capper is probably somebody who's generating company dollar to the tune of about 18000 a year, which means they're probably doing two or $3 million a year in, in business. They're probably doing a half dozen, six deals a year. That's somebody who's doing it frequently enough to know what they're doing. They've got to the winner circle enough times, but they're not so busy that they might not be able to, to partner. So go find a wingman. And you don't have to have the opportunity immediately. You just kind of go and start to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working really hard here. And I'm taking classes and I'm learning how to do some things and I'm in Ignite and I'm learning how to do lead generation and I'm going to find an opportunity and I'm not going to be 100% ready. When that opportunity comes, would you be willing to be my partner? Would you be willing to be my wingman? I'll cut you in. We'll split the commission 50-50, 60-40, whatever you decide. I don't care. But something that you agree to, if you're newer and you don't know who the players are yet, and because of COVID, you're not going into your market center, one of the ways you'll start to figure that out is to start to see whose faces are you seeing in Zoom. But you can't always tell who's doing business and who's not based on the Zoom profiles. I would go back to your team leader. I would go back to your agent services coordinators in your market centers. And I would start to ask them. I might even reach out to the broker because your broker knows who's doing the business. Your broker, he or she is signing off on all of it. And start to just quick send a quick email to your broker and say, who would you recommend I talk to? If you're in the coaching lobby program and not all of our market centers are in that program right now, I do believe that we're moving towards getting every one of our market centers into that coaching program. We're not there yet, I don't believe. But if you are in that program, which should be Tenafly and Ridgewood at this point, um, reach out and ask your coach, who do you recommend? Who, who's in this office? Guys, if you're in the Ridgewood market center with 500 agents, I can promise you, I can think off the top of my head, a half a dozen or 10 agents that I would go and talk to, to see if they would be my wingman, go find one. And then when the opportunity comes, you have the security of knowing that I'm less likely to put myself in a position to fall down and look stupid because I got a wingman who's gonna keep me safe, right? Does that make sense, right? I hope, I hope it does, right? You know, here's the queen with her elite bodyguards. You know, the queen is not a ninja. My wife is really into the crown. I'm not much of a, a crown person myself, 
but my wife is all over it. And I got to tell you something, one of the ways that you can kind of be this little, tiny little lady, powerful little lady, is you got big, tough dudes looking right over your shoulder who are going to keep you safe. Make no mistake, this guy is an elite member of the Royal Military, and he will keep her safe. That's what your wingman needs you. And when you have the confidence of knowing that you've got somebody who always have your back, then you can kind of wear funny hats and walk around in town and not really care what people think, right? If this is what it looks like. These aren't really real muscles, but it feels real. This I can't do it becomes I can do it. The power of a wingman is important. And for better or for worse, Keller Williams by, just by choice has chosen not to have a mentoring program. We've chose to rely more on coaches than mentors. And, and the real reason for that is throughout the industry, most of the mentoring that's done is not by the elite. Most of the mentoring that's done, quite honestly, because I was involved in mentoring programs in other companies. When you have an agent who's really not succeeding, but they don't really have anything else going on, that's the person that we say, well, back in the day, you know, you have done this once before. Back in the day, you used to be a pretty good agent. You haven't done any business in the last five years, but you used to do pretty okay. You kind of be the one who be, is the mentor. And, and what you find is in that model, frequently, the mentors didn't have enough current real life experience to be relevant. And the agents who were paying 40% of their commission were feeling like, I didn't get enough value for this. And so we chose as a company by design to not have a mentors program, but to have a coaching program and to have a, a training program like the one that I teach and the one that we're doing here right now. I still think you need a wingman. You need to go hire a mentor. You need to kind of borrow their muscles until you develop your own. But then you do have to have a growth plan, right? What do I really need to learn? What do I already know how to do? Play from your strengths. Trust that 90% of what you need, you've already got. But what am I relying on my wingman for? And how do I put that together for my own learning? It's a growth plan is a prioritized list of things that you'll bring to the conscious competence and then into unconscious competence over time. And, and I'd encourage you to, to really kind of put a calendar together, right? And start to say, okay, what do I need to learn first? What do I need to learn second? What do I need to learn third? Guys, if you're just in the very growth phase of your business, what you probably don't need to learn right now is all the ins and outs of how to close a transaction in command. What you do need to learn how to do is how to put a lead into command and how to start to have some conversations, right? What do I need to learn first? What do I need to learn second? What do I need to learn third? The problem of, of starting something new for the first time for adult learners is we want to learn everything immediately. And what happens is it lends itself to this fire hose experience where you're like, I'm just trying to take a sip here, but oh my God, it almost ripped my head off, right? We can control the fire hose. We can help you focus. Here's what I would encourage you to focus on. If you're newer, start with Ignite. Start with Ignite. Don't spend time doing a lot of other stuff yet. Start with Ignite, get the basics down. We know the 10-4 activities of talking to people, putting people in your database, following up with them, and, and, and previewing property. That's where you start. And Ignite will give you the over six weeks. What else, right? Within your first 90 days, do Ignite. And then start to talk, take some other classes around marketing. Start to focus on what did I learn in Ignite that I need to learn how to do that I haven't learned well that I'm relying on a wingman for in the beginning. I'm borrowing their muscles, but then put yourself together into a learning plan. Where would I go to learn it? Is it a class that, that I can learn online at Keller Williams? Is it a class I can self-teach in Keller Williams University? Is it classes that I can go get at the board level? Is it learning that I can get on YouTube? Guys, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube that you can learn from some really, really wonderfully qualified people. Be careful though, that in a digital universe, there's a good and a bad of the digital universe right now. Here's the, to me, the very, very good. Through podcasts on my phone, through digital books, I can invite into my world and hear from people that are really, really influential thinkers. My, pad, my, my podcast is full of everybody from Gary Vaynerchuk to John Maxwell to Brene Brown to Gary Keller to pick somebody 
they're all in here because in a podcast environment, you can hear, you can learn right from the very, very smartest and the best. You can go onto social media in some of the Facebook groups and you can build community and you can become a part of community of some of the biggest thinkers. And that's great. But there's also a lot of wannabes out there. You can also listen to a bunch of folks who don't really have much to say, but are really comfortable telling it. You can spend a lot of time in some of these Facebook groups. I'll give you an example. Nick Baldwin, a friend of mine who started the Lab Code Agent Groups, probably the largest real estate Facebook group, the most engaged Facebook group on the planet. Probably 150,000 members right now. And I see all day, every day, I don't see all day because I don't go on it all day. But when I go on, I start to see lots of people putting a question out there that asks a question. Hey, I'm newer. What should I do about this? And there's a string of 530 responses, probably 400 of them from people who've never done a deal in their life, who've got an awful lot to say about what you should or shouldn't be doing. Be really careful about surrounding yourself with the right people. What we're going to try to teach you in the classes here in KW, that what I try to teach here on Zoom is best practice. It's what have people who've done this learned how to do? How do we learn from their experiences and teach that? But, but podcasts, um, audiobooks, uh, YouTube channels, you can surround yourself with very specific learning. Your growth plan is all about figuring out what am I leaning on my wingman for? Where can I go to get that skill myself? How can I teach it and practice it until it goes from being consciously competent to unconsciously competent and I can make that shift? And, and what I'd encourage you to do is to have a calendar. What am I going to try to le learn in December? What am I going to try to learn in January? What am I going to try to learn in February? Where am I going to go to learn it? How am I going to measure whether I've learned it or not? If you want help thinking about putting a growth plan together for yourself, what I would say is jump on one of my office hours, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from three to four, and we can start to talk about how do you think about that? But one of the critical things that we do is know what we're good at, know what our strengths are, rely on a wingman for the things that we haven't mastered, and then go out and start to learn it ourselves and practice it. Now, Here's the thing, that requires time. Mastery is time on task over time, right? There was a, uh, a, an interesting study that was referenced in the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. And it had to do with an art class in college where there were two groups of people that were learning how to make pottery, right? And they were both tasked with, at the end of the day, creating the most perfect pot. And there were two different approaches. One group was tasked to go out and do the research and study the material and to figure out the dimensions and what would be the elements in terms of the glazing and all that stuff. What would be required to create the most perfect pot, spend a lot of time, get it figured out, and then try to create it. The second group was, designed, was tasked with, don't worry about it. Just start making pots. And if you screw up, try it again, make another one. If you screw it, try it again, make another one. At the end of the semester, when it came time to evaluate which group made the most pots, what the truth was is that in the eyes of the experts, the group that didn't spend a whole lot of time trying to overthink it, they just got out after it and started doing it, they made better pottery. And that is time on task over time, which means the first pottery thing spun out and fell on the floor. The second one turned into a big wobbly thing that stood up for a while and then it lost its balance and it fell down. Being able to endure falling down and getting up and falling down and getting up is taxing. And it requires some resilience. And, you know, there's some hacks that will help you with resilience. I see a chat box light. Let me just see what the chat question is. Uh, Julie Kushner, happy to help as a mentor. Last year, she did $5 million in New York and New Jersey with a rigid office license for 11 years. Julia has put her phone and email in chat. If you are looking for a mentor, she's putting herself out there. Someone who's done that level of business is exactly the kind of person I'm talking about in New York and New Jersey, right? Go find a wingman. Julia, kudos to you for stepping up. Let me share a couple of hacks because what I know is that there's nothing that helps you feel less like an imposter than is to feel confident. And there's nothing that helps you feel more confident than having successfully done something. And that means we fall down a bunch of different times. So there's two hacks that I'm going to touch on here. One is affirmation. The second is power posing. 
Affirmation, if you were in a Lunch and Learn a week or so ago, we talked about affirmation. And we talked about what is affirmation. Affirmation is the repetition of something that you are affirming to be true in your life and you affirm it again and again. And by affirming it, you becomes to be true. It becomes true. Everybody remembers the little children's story about the little engine that could, right? Who had the big engine, had to get the big train up the hill and he's chugging away. And what is he saying to himself as he's doing? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And he gets that little chugging up the hill until he crests the top of the hill and it becomes, I knew I could, I knew I could, I knew I could. It's just a simple way that we try to teach children the importance of affirmation and believing in yourself, but don't just say it, say it again and again and again. Every major religion in the world has an affirmation of faith. It's this thing that we say, this is what it means. This is what we believe. Every child in America recites the Pledge of Allegiance every day at school, which is nothing more than an affirmation about the importance of civic life. And one of the things that we need to do as we're trying to crest that hill and moving from I think I can to I know I could in our own lives is I got to find a way to keep affirming the right stuff. And, and affirmations, what we find, if you're in the affirmation class, what we find is it's a mistake to sometimes affirm things that you aspire to that aren't true yet. Like I'm a great salesperson. It's one that's been in the industry, the sales industry forever. I am a great salesperson. They are home, they are happy, and they can't wait to hear me call them, right? And we affirm that in every element of sales. And uh, did, they, did you guys affirm stuff like that in, in life sales, life insurance sales? I'm pretty sure you probably did. Every sales professional does. And the problem with that kind of an affirmation is it doesn't pass the BS meter. I'm a great salesperson. I'm a great salesperson. I'm a great salesperson. In the back of your head, you're like, dude, you are not a great salesperson yet. I mean, you want to be, but I know you because I am you and you're not that good. And, and what the research tells us is that when we start lying to ourselves, what we actually do is create a heightened level of stress that actually impacts our performance in a negative way. What works from a performance standpoint is if we can get anchored in things that we truly believe are true about ourselves and our values, and if we can affirm those things and get anchored in those things, the confidence that that brings about ourselves, the self-confidence that we have in that moment will help us to perform better on whatever task is in front of us. And so if we ask you to do affirmations based on values, what do you believe in? Why does that matter to you? Write about a time when you express that in your life, right? These are the basis of the things that we're truly confirming about ourselves. <clears throat> what do you believe to be true? Are you a good mom? Are you a, a loyal friend? Are you honest? Are you trustworthy? Because those are the things that if they're true and we affirm those things, I'm a good mom and I'm honest and I'm trustworthy. I'm a loyal friend. I'm honest and I'm trustworthy. Yeah, what begins to happen is we affirm those things again and again and again. And deep down inside, you start to say, damn straight. That is actually true about me. And I feel good about those things because they're at the core of who I am. And when I feel good and I feel confident, what begins to happen is that sense of confidence overrides the imposter syndrome. That sense of confidence in that moment improves your performance on whatever task is before you. The research was done at Stanford on math tests. And what we asked people to do, graduate students to do, was to not do an affirmation that says, I'm a math genius. Not affirm, I'm really good at math. I'm really good at math. I'm really good at math. And then I go take a math test. It was, go affirm your core values. I'm a good and loyal friend. I'm a good dad. And I affirm that again and again and again. And the sense of self-confidence in who I am, now when I go and take the math test, you're going to perform better on the math test, even though your affirmation had nothing to do with math. That's the kind of affirmation right now that I think gets you through this unconscious competence phase. That's the kind of affirmation that we can get anchored in. And here's why. This is, you know, an example. My family is always my highest priority. That's something that's true in my world. I can affirm that again and again and again and again, and then go do something that I've never done before and perform better because of the level of self-confidence. 
The research is done by Amy Cuddy. She's at the Harvard MBA business program. And here's what she says. When we're reminded of who we really are, it's okay to not be perfect. The imposter syndrome is anchored in, you ain't all that. The imposter syndrome is anchored in, you ain't perfect and people are gonna find out. The imposter syndrome is anchored in, I am gonna get exposed for being a fraud. And when you can anchor in this, who are you really? And when you're good with who you are really, it's okay to not be perfect, then you got to fight and chance, especially if you got a wingman with you. Then you got a chance to go in there and say, you know what? I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fall down. And I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fall down. And I remember, I got to tell you, I'm going to talk about my own parenting for a second. My daughter, she was kind of a late bloomer and everything. And she still kind of is. She didn't walk till she was 17 months old. Right now, I got friends right now whose kids are out motoring around at like 10 months and are all that. Emily didn't really take a step much until she was 16, seven months old. That was, that was late. And I was concerned. And you know what my mother said to me? She said, look, I can promise you this. I've never seen any bride go down the aisle at her wedding, sitting on her butt, wearing a diaper. She's going to figure it out, right? You're going to learn how to fall down with grace, but you're going to learn how to fall down but when you can show up cool with who you really are, then falling down doesn't matter. If you've got a wingman with you, they're going to have your back. This kind of affirmational practice, a lot of people say, man, that's just airy-fairy stuff. That's just not business-like enough for me. Okay, you don't have to do it. But I can tell you this, when you get to elite performers, because I've studied elite performers for decades, when you get to elite athletes, when you get to elite musicians, when you get to the elite hostage negotiators of the world, they do this because they know it matters. Here's affirmation and purpose. I swipe this right out of the Ignite coursework. Here's a quick affirmation that keeps us focused in why are we playing? I'm making these calls and here's the model. I'm making these calls to provide for my parents or whatever your reason is. I'm making these calls to provide for my parents by paying off their house because they supported and provided for me and I want to enable them to retire with confidence when we can create not only affirmations that are anchored in who are we, what are our values, but when we can write affirmations that keep us focused on why am I falling down so much in the first place? Why do I keep wanting to get back up again? Because there's something else that I'm playing for bigger than me. You know, I've studied elite performance for decades. I've also studied survival. And it's interesting when you look at people who have lived out in the wilderness, who've gotten lost and separated, and they're out in the wilderness for weeks and weeks and weeks and finally get found. One of the things that you find is what keeps them alive is that they didn't want to come back for themselves. What kept them alive was that they needed to come back for their kids or someone else that depended on them, somebody else who needed them to come back. It's really easy for us to give up if we're only playing for ourselves. It's much harder to give up if you're playing for somebody else. Affirmations, a big part of it. And here's the last hack. It's this hack that we call power posing. And what is power posing? Again, if you wanna learn more about this, just study, just type power posing into Google and you're gonna find lots of information. Go look at Amy Cuddy's TED Talk. She's the professor that I just referenced at the Harvard Business School and watch her TED Talk or go get her book called Presence, which is wonderful. Um, and what Amy studied, here's, here's, her, here's her deal. Amy, to give you a little background, Amy is a research psychologist in the MBA program at Harvard. And the reason why they brought her in was they noticed that their Harvard graduates in their MBA program were not getting hired at any higher rate than MBA grads in other lesser qualified schools. And they started to say, look, if you graduate from Harvard with an MBA, you're smart enough, you know enough. You, if you graduate from Harvard with an MBA, um, you're going to um, probably score some pretty damn good interviews. And yet Harvard grads were not necessarily getting hired at any higher rate than people in lesser tier schools. And what they determined was it wasn't what they knew, it's how they performed in the interview. And what they were starting to try to figure out is how do we help people learn how to perform better under stressful circumstances. Affirmation was one element to that. 
But here's the thing they also found is that when people perform at their best is that when they're at their most confident. And when people are at their most confident and feel the most powerful, they tend to posture in different ways. You look at this peacock here. This is normal peacock. This is power pose peacock, right? When we tend to feel more powerful, we tend to carry more expansive postures. And make no mistake, here's what they learned in the research at, at the Harvard MBA in the interviewing process. Prior to going into the interview, what were people doing? They're sitting in the waiting room, crunched over on their phones in a very contracted posture. That is a very not powerful posture. And what we know is that broader, more powerful, when you're out in the woods and they come up to a bear, what do they say? Try to get big, act big, just look in sports. Here's an example. Let me see if I can get my mouse to come back to where I need it to be. Here's an example. There's Derek Jeter. What does he do? He hits the home run in the in November World Series. It's this. You go through the tape. It's this. It's a big, powerful pose. Guys, I'm here to tell you that I shared this story in Ignite. My niece, Amy, who was born blind, who has never seen a thing in her life. Anytime Amy does anything cool, it's this. She's never seen that. It's just the way that human beings behave. Guys, if you can, there's a, some noise in the background and my mouse is acting poorly. So oh, I think I can get it back here. I'm going to mute folks if I can't hear because there's a little noise in the background. I'll move through these slides quickly. Guys, here's what power posing looks like. Again, this comes right out of uh, the research at Harvard is powerful poses are big and expansive. Lower energy is small and contracted. What if before we did this, the stressful task, what if we struck a pose and held it? What would that look like? Here's the, the thought is if we're, if we strike a larger pose when we feel more powerful, can we actually trick ourselves into feeling more powerful simply by the poses that we strike? That was the premise of the research. What we've learned is that 75% of the nerve pathways between the brain and the body are sending information from the body to the brain. 25% of the nerve pathways send information from the brain to the body. If we can trick our body into being bigger, can we cause our brain to feel more powerful? And guess what the research proves overwhelmingly true is the answer is yes. It actually changes our cortisol levels in our body. It changes our testosterone levels in our body. It's taking a big pose and holding it for three minutes. Three minutes is kind of the opportune time. Just holding this big expansive pose or before you go into the listening presentation, walking with big bold steps and arm sways, that kind of big posturing changes the chemistry in your body, and it causes you to feel more confident in the moment. These are really powerful hacks that you can learn how to use during this transition period until you gain the confidence from experience. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, if you can share these hacks and use them in your own life and share these with the people that you love, I'm going to tell you, these are powerful. These are very powerful. I have coached to some of this information for years now. And what I'm finding is as crazy as it sounds, people find this works. I have coached real estate agents going into very, very stressful listing appointments. They're like, I am so nervous right now, but I'm going to do this anyway because I don't know what else to do. I said, look, go find a bathroom stall to stand in and hold this pose, right? Don't be standing out there. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to walk into your listing presentation and go, hi, guys, I'm here. Don't do that, please. They're going to be like looking at each other going, who is this guy? This guy's scaring me. Get him out of here. But I do want you to do is hold the pose three to five minutes and then go do your thing with your wingman. While you're holding the, holding the pose, you might want to do some affirmations. Those little hacks is the tail wagging the dog. Those little hacks are ways that you can trick yourself into feeling confident in the moment before the experience dictates that you should feel confident yet. And it's just a bridge during this transitional period, right? strike a pose. This is the Wonder Woman pose, right? It looks like Wonder Woman. Did you ever notice that Superman always kind of stands there like this, right? This is the victory pose, arms up, right? The Statue of Liberty pose. They have all these different names. This is Roar, right? Guys, these poses work. And so remember, as we're wrapping this up, 
because it's one o'clock. Look, the imposter syndrome is, com is, is a thing. Everyone who's an adult who moves into an area that they've asked to perform where they don't have confidence, a competence yet, is gonna experience the imposter syndrome. There's a small group of folks who don't. And those people are sociopaths. I'm not kidding, Howard, I'm not kidding. There is a small group of people that don't have the ability to self-regulate and say, you know what? I really don't know what I'm doing. Sociopaths are like, I'm, I'm great all the time. I don't ever make mistakes. That's a dangerous place. Everybody gets the imposter syndrome, right? And so here's the trick. We know the secret. The secret is be clear on what you need. Be clear on what it takes to be successful. Trust that you already know enough. Everything that I learned, says Robert Fulham, everything I learned, I needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Everything that you need at the core to be successful in real estate about building relationship, building rapport, negotiating, all that stuff, you've already got that figured out for better or for worse on some level. There's industry specific stuff that you're gonna be taught over time, build a growth plan, get a wingman for a while, and then leverage these hacks. You do all those things, you're gonna be fine you are going to be fine. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surrender game. It's a surrender game that says, this is just part of it. And the quicker I'm willing to fall down and get back up, the quicker I'm going to learn how to balance. The quicker I'm willing to fall down and get back up, the quicker I'm going to feel confident enough to take a step. If I allow myself to wait until I figured everything else that I need to know, I'm never going to get up. I'm going to run out of runway. And what's going to happen? And guys, I've seen this happen for decades. I don't want this to happen for you. Because of our crazy compensation model, if you wait until you know how to do it, you're going to run out of money and then have to go out and do something else. I don't want you to have to give up on your dream because you couldn't make enough money quick enough, right? All right, we're a couple minutes after one o'clock. As I always do, I'm gonna ask for just a couple of ahas and I'll take a look at chat. I always ask for people, give me some light bulbs, anything you're thinking differently about. I see uh, Dami's got a question in um, chat. Where do you find previous classes? You'll find those classes on the YouTube channel, the Bergen County Partner YouTube channel. There's lots of classes there. But any, any takeaways, any ahas for anybody? Anything like that you're going to do different today? I like the power posing idea. Power pose. Yeah. It's a real thing, man. It is amazing. But it really works. Anything else? I'm going to give you homework then. Go find a wingman. Look around. Who do you aspire to be in your office? Who do you respect? Whose business would you like to model? That's the kind of wingman you're looking for, right? You got a wingman in, in right here. Uh, Julie is a good agent. She's done this before. She's offering to help. Lean on agents like Julia. But what you want is you want to have a wingman before you have an opportunity. Because if you start looking for one in real time, it's going to be too much stress. Go find somebody and maybe it's, I don't have the opportunity yet, but if I get one, would you help me? Let's take a look at what that would look like. Then you're gonna feel confident to make that opportunity show up because you're not worried about showing up because you know you got somebody, you know, you can show up and be the queen because you know you got that big tough guy behind you, right? That's your homework. All right, guys, other than that, uh, I fortunately have a wingman, Cindy says who she met in the office before COVID. We became friends and she's a great help, right? It's great. Mm -hmm. And guys, no, look, in the meantime, look, your team leaders, oh, me, reach out. You know, reach out. You know, I, I can't answer every question. I may point you in the direction of some of the ones that I can't help with, but I would rather you know that you could at least reach out if you had to, right? We're all here together. All right, guys, that's where we're going to park this one today and uh, have yourself a great afternoon. I'll talk to you all soon.